in our profession. With the right knowledge and experience, the sky's the limit. And whilst we know the letters after your name are an important sign of standards, professionalism and trust, it's not all we're about. We're also focused on furthering our members' careers by giving you access to a community of like-minded professionals, all bound by the same code of ethics. There's newsletters, technical papers, podcasts, and so much more great content to facilitate your CPD. Like hundreds of regular face-to-face -face meetings and digital events, making it easy to stay on top of industry trends and to network with members all over the country. Our societies mean that whether you're a broker, claims, or underwriting professional, our approach is tailored for you. And with membership, you can work towards chartered status for a place amongst the experts in your field. If you have knowledge to share or want to learn, you can sign up to our e-mentoring platform to connect and exchange ideas and support. And not forgetting the perks save on a range of products and services or access our legal helpline for free confidential advice. Get more from your membership today. Good morning and welcome once again. Uh, I'm Roger Flaxman and with me as usual is Michael Wilson, who is uh, already very well known to a great many of you. Now today we're going to address a conundrum that repeatedly arises in the disputed cases that we deal with here at Flaxman. It concerns um, what we believe to be an oversight in the drafting of the Insurance Act 2015. In our opinion, it's a matter that needs special attention by the industry because it's a matter that goes to the heart of treating the customer fairly and also to the root of the integrity of insurance contracts and therefore to our industry. Now, if you don't already know, and I'm sure many of you do, we at Flaxman are relentless uh, on our campaign to improve the value and the integrity of contracts of insurance. The CII has very kindly acknowledged our efforts um, a year ago by giving us an award for promoting the public in our industry. And I have to say, we're very grateful for that award and acknowledgement. So thank you, CII. Now, we take this very seriously because um, Insurance really is a hugely important um, commodity and to the strength and to the sustainability of our economy. And it really must not be allowed to be treated as a game. Now, sadly, some insurers do treat it as a game because they challenge the insured with clever arguments and the certain knowledge that the insured doesn't know enough challenge them back. And that's not going to uh, help the industry regain the trust of the insuring public. I might say more about this later because it is very important, uh, sorry, very important to the future of all of us um, that we become trusted once again by the people that we rely upon for our industry. But it is becoming, I have to say, um, even more difficult for trust to be engendered in the public in an industry that is um, day by day relying upon technology and remote contact, remote selling, that takes us further and further and further and further and further and further away from the people that we need to support. That's an issue that we really do need to address as an industry. We can't expect people that don't know us to trust us. So what is the issue? In a nutshell, it is the unequal difference in the treatment of a misrepresentation of material information from the treatment of a breach of condition or warranty. 
Now, Michael and I were um, saying only yesterday that we would we would dearly love to be uh, addressing you as a live audience. We gather that there's over 400 of you signed up today. That would be quite a big haul. But we would just love to be able to have the opportunity of taking questions and hearing your opinions on this topic, because it, it really does affect almost every one of you from time to time. And um, we know from the work that we're doing just how damaging avoidance of a policy for any reason can be to the customer. It can be devastating and life-changing. And that's why it mustn't be treated as a game. And that's why uh, we've decided to raise uh, this issue uh, you for your attention, because I think it probably needs some work on it. So, Michael, would you like to um, start with the learning objectives? Well, thank you, Roger. Thank you for that introduction. So um, I'll just read through the learning objectives. Uh, number one, to appreciate the basis on which a policy of insurance may be avoided by the insurer for misrepresentation. To review the protection afforded the policyholder and circumstances where a policy may not be avoided. To compare claims outcomes where an indemnity might be denied because of a breach of policy condition or b a non-disclosure and to discuss the potential for unfair outcomes where a claim highlights a non-disclosure that is not causative of the loss so those are our learning objectives so we'll uh, we'll do our best to steer you through that so um, our next slide here is uh, non-disclosure leads to avoidance now, Roger, we know that um, many insurers will exercise this um, option to avoid a policy where there's been uh, a non-disclosure or a misrepresentation. But there is some protection for the uh, policyholder built into the, the two acts there. And I just wondered if you could uh, make some comment on that, Roger. Well, the, the, the principle, really, of the... Uh... The first act, the Insurance Act, is to give the policyholder a bit more of a sporting chance of uh, getting a claim paid when there's what we might call in the industry a technical breach. Um, and in particular in the Act, it refers to the matters of warranties, conditions of warranties, where if a loss arises that was not um, causative behind the warranty, then the warranty won't be applied. That doesn't apply if the uh, breach is of misrepresentation. And what we're looking at in the context of um, the Act and also the CEDRA, in other words, the Consumer Insurance Disclosure Representations, is although um, we publicly said at the time, we really think these are pretty damn good. Um, and, you know, we kind of gave the Law Commission a bit of a pat on the back for coming up to something that we thought worked. Uh, having experienced now five years of claims being made under the Act, we're looking at it again and saying, is there an imbalance here that needs to be rectified? Roger, can, can I just ask you, therefore, um... Is an insurer entitled to avoid any policy based on any non-disclosure? So to give you an example, if uh, a policyholder has forgotten to disclose a previous claim, uh, the insurer notices that. Uh, is he always entitled to avoid the policy in an example such as that? Well, no. I mean, the avoidance of a policy is very much a matter of law. And there's got to be a fundamental breach, which gives the, the entitlement for um, uh, uh, avoidance ab initio. The problem is um, that the law is interpretable by lawyers and judges, and it is reinterpretable by experts in the insurance industry. And we know, Mike, from doing this for nearly 20 years, 
that there is absence of consistency in what we believe are the reasons for the term. And we see some absurd, don't we? We see some absurd uh, suggestions that we can avoid the policy because you didn't tell us this, uh, didn't tell us that. And really, the point of what we're saying here is that every case is going to be decided on its fact. There isn't a generic answer, but you can't just uh, avoid a policy as some underwriters seem to want to do by saying, oh, we didn't know that. We didn't know that, therefore, and, and I suppose, uh, we, we avoid the policy. Back, and, and coming back to these two acts, Roger, I suppose the, the fundamental protection is that it's up to the insurer to demonstrate that had the information been disclosed, either they, they wouldn't have offered terms at all or they no. would have uh, underwritten it on different terms. So it's, it's not an automatic yeah, avoidance here, is it? The insurer has got to put some work. No. They have, and so, it's got to be but, reasonable. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for that. Um, under the uh, Consumer uh, Act, um, th there is uh, these categories of misrepresentation. And uh, I, what I just wanted to, to flag up at this uh, point, and, and it's a, a step in the voidance process, which is sometimes overlooked by insurers. And maybe that's something to do with the way in which the wording of CEDRA is, is, is a little bit cumbersome and sometimes difficult to follow. But fundamentally, for an insurer to void a consumer contract, following a non-disclosure, they must show that at least the policyholder has failed to exercise reasonable care. If the insurer cannot yes. show that the policyholder has been careless, if they can't show that, it's, it's just that it was an inadvertent uh, omission. But if the conclusion is that the policyholder took reasonable care to answer the questions that... Uh, either at inception or renewal, then actually the insurer has no remedy, and so therefore the policy cannot be voided. So we just wanted to flag that up. And then, of course, there are the other categories, uh, such as recklessness and deliberate non-disclosure. Yeah. Roger, this actually raises the issue, and it's a, it's a very difficult one, and, and I often find myself thinking this one through. In a case such as this, how, how on earth do you establish whether or not a policyholder has exercised reasonable care? Well, um, as a seasoned expert to the court, I think I can probably say I am now, having done over 200 cases in the recent years, um, reasonableness is always a test that is applied by the court. However, I'm often asked, what do you think was reasonable under all the circumstances? And um, I don't have a stock answer because, again, it depends on the circumstances of the matter. But if you want to look at it as a generic position, surely um, reasonable is for the insured to take the buying of insurance sufficiently seriously as to not to mislead the insurer. And I'll say that again, for the insured to take the buying of insurance sufficiently seriously as to not mislead the insurer. Because what he's saying to the insurer is, I want you to trust me, because if I have a loss, I want you to pay me. It's not a promise to pay. A lot of people think it is. It isn't a promise to pay. But actually, if I have a loss, I want you to pay me. I'm being reasonable, and I'll tell you what I think you need to know. Now, the big conundrum, and this is something that the law has failed and the industry, in my opinion, has failed to address. It's all very well saying that uh, the insured must tell the um, everything that a prudent underwriter would want to know. But there isn't an insured on the planet that knows what a prudent underwriter does want to know. That's the fundamental problem. Um, I think that we've got to look at this on the basis of what is reasonable is to answer the questions that are asked and to turn your mind, and this is very important for insurance brokers when they're leading their client, to 
turn the client's or the opposer's mind to the kinds of things that they know as a broker an insurer could reasonably want to know. So, for example, if a property has suffered from subsidence in the last 15 to 20 years, actually, I think that's something that a reasonable underwriter would want to know. On the other hand, if a business, um, uh, and I'll just give you an example of a, of a, of a thing I'm dealing with at the moment. Um, I'm dealing with a, a care home, and the care home has about seven directors of it, one of which in uh, 1989 um, wound up a business with some money left over, I'm sorry, without enough money in it, and therefore there was a judgment against them. And that uh, 1989 incident has been cited by an insurer as material fact that they'd known that in 1989 uh, that director had suffered that ignominy, then they wouldn't have taken on the risk. Well, frankly, I don't believe it. But that is the kind of okay. thing, when we're looking at reasonableness, you've got to sort of make these balances. <laughs> right. Okay, well, uh, that's a very interesting aspect, and I suppose we could discuss uh, reasonable care all day, but uh, unfortunately our time is short. So I just want to look at um, a couple of examples. The first one is a, is a, a consumer <laughs> case, and we're imagining here that we have uh, an insurance company that only wants to accept... Uh, home insurance uh, proposals where the doors have got five lever mortise deadlocks. So they're obviously very security mm. conscious. <clears throat> so they, they've taken that decision. They're only going to accept uh, the good risks. And so the insurer has a choice. They can um, include the issue on the statement of fact. So on the statement of fact, there could be a declaration to the effect that um, my uh, all my exterior doors are protected with five lever mortise deadlocks or uh, the insurer could tackle the same uh, aim instead of doing it on the statement of fact they could impose a condition or a warranty to that effect on the policy so uh, what difference does this make if there's a claim well in this uh, example of ours we 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 have a a theft claim and uh, what happened was that the thief smashed a window to get into the house and went out again through the same window. So um, under uh, the Insurance Act, there's some protection there for the, uh, for the insured because if this matter of the locks was dealt with by a condition or a warranty, it would be fairly straightforward for the insured to be able to demonstrate that actually, although they had been in breach of the warranty, because in actual fact they only had three lever mortise deadlocks instead of five, so they were clearly in breach of the condition, but it could also be shown that that was not causative of the loss. There was no connection between that breach because the, the, th the, the thief came in through a window. Mm. However, if the issue was dealt with under a statement of fact, the insurer could complain that it would never have accepted that risk had it known that the locks were not up to scratch. And so as soon as that uh, misrepresentation comes to light, and assume, assuming the insurer could show that the insured had been careless, they could, they could void that policy. And this is mm. why we're using this example, because it, it highlights that in identical set of circumstances, an insured can have a completely different fate, depending on whether the issue was under the statement of fact or uh, through the imposition of a, of a condition. So, Roger, do, do you have any thoughts as to whether that's um, fair? Well, I think that my thought is very simply, the question is, why is it like that? Because the point is that if, um, uh, if the causation of the loss, if, if the underwriter says, I want you to have five lever five, uh, mortis deadlocks, and the loss occurs despite them, then he wasn't clever enough to say, and I want something else as well. <laughs> so it's just a mismatch of fairness, isn't it? And there's not much more to say. But the fact remains is, as the law stands, 
There are occasions like this where, where the insurer could decide to, to void the policy and not pay the claim. Yeah. So let, let's look okay. at another uh, case, which is a commercial case. Um, this is uh, a public liability insurer who wants to avoid claims connected with the application of heat. So it's very similar to the previous example. So the insurer can either include it on a statement of fact so that the proposer is invited to declare that he he doesn't use blow torches and the like. Um, this is a, a, a painter and a, and a decorator. So they would often use a blow torch or some other application of heat. The insurer wants to avoid that, so it, it's catered for in the statement of fact. Or alternatively, the insurer could put a condition on the policy to say that uh, in the event of um, a claim under the public liability insurance, there will be no indemnity where there has been an application of heat. So mm -hmm. we could have an example here where the decorator uh, uh, has an accident in, in a customer's home. He, he kicks over a couple of pots of paint. He ruins the, the carpet and causes some other damage to uh, contents. And he's in receipt of a, of a claim from the aggrieved third party. Uh, under investigation, it turns out that from time to time, this decorator does use a blowtorch. It had nothing at all to do with the claim because he wasn't using the blowtorch on the day. But when it comes to light that there is this application of heat, the insurer would be entitled to uh, void the policy uh, if it was catered for under the statement of fact. However, if the protection that the insurer sought was uh, catered for by application of a condition or a warranty, they would not be able to avoid the claim because there was no connection between the breach and the claim that actually happened. So, again, it's, a, it's, it's another anomaly. And just to highlight on this one, because it was a commercial insurance, the insurer doesn't even have to show that the applicant for insurance had been careless. So the, the, the policy could be voided simply on the fact that the information on the statement of fact was incorrect. Uh, we probably don't need to discuss that one further because it's very similar to the previous example. Uh, so just coming on to the, um, this slide, we're just posing the question here as Flaxmans, should an insurer be permitted to avoid a policy for misrepresentation where the claim giving rise to the inquiry is not connected to the breach. Now, you've already said, Roger, that we needn't be in this situation, but the fact is we are. And do you, think the, industry should do, do you think the industry should do anything about it? Well, I think, it's a, I think it's an issue. This is why we're raising it today. I think it's an issue that ought to be discussed. Uh, we, you know, we may have up to 400 people in front of us at the moment with differing views, and I think the important thing is to hear them. Because um, let's make this quite clear. We've said this before, but we'll say it again. Um, the, the industry isn't redolent with people who are avoiding policies willy-nilly. But when they do happen, they can be very, very serious consequences. And what we're looking at is here is a situation which doesn't appear, and I'm saying not in a theoretical way, when we're dealing with these things, we're dealing with these issues, they don't appear to us to be fair, fair and reasonable. And I can also say that in the numerous uh, occasions that I deal with solicitors and counsel on these things, counsel very often say, actually, it isn't really fair, is it? But, you know, is there something more to this than meets the eye? Now, actually, you know, when we're talking about trust and professionalism in our industry, this is an opportunity for us to regain our professional status by making our own mind up as a, as a profession. What do we think is the right thing to do? We don't need a lawyer to tell us what our professional skills are. We shouldn't, anyway. We should actually be able to say, actually, as professional people, as professional bona fide good and prudent underwriters, yeah, there is an issue here that needs addressing or not. Now, we happen to believe, because we're the kind of people that we are, that, you know, we think 
We don't think every claim should be paid. In fact, we often have to say to a client, actually, I'm sorry, old Jack, but, you know, you were in breach and the insurer is right. And we will say that, you know. Uh, yesterday afternoon. It wasn't pleasant, but I had to say it. But the point is that where it appears that it's unreasonable, we ought to, as an industry, I think, take the same view that the FOS is required to take, which might, you can explain how the FOS uh, way of looking at things is fundamentally different from that of the law. Perhaps that's a good opportunity for you just to remind everybody how that is. Well, thank you very much. In fact, um, the two examples we've just looked at demonstrate an absurdity. But there are other decisions that um, might not look quite so absurd. In fact, um, I'm grateful for a CII member, Keith, who got in touch with, the, with me recently, and he brought my attention to uh, three or four recent um, FOS decisions, which sort of touch on this subject. And these were cases where past subsidence had not been disclosed at inception of the insurance or at renewal. And um, the reason that this non-disclosure of subsidence had come to light was that the insured had had an unconnected claim. Uh, and in one example, it was a, a theft claim. So the insurer was, was looking at a, quite a substantial theft claim and then discovered that there'd been a, a non-disclosure of previous subsidence. And of course, non-disclosure of subsidence is a very serious matter because subsidence claims are very, very expensive usually for insurers. Sometimes they take many years to be resolved. And so it's not an issue to be taken lightly. And if somebody fails to disclose uh, subsidence, then... Um, maybe you could argue it's fair and reasonable that the policy should be voided, subject to all the other information. But if you think about it, the principle is much the same as the consumer with the incorrect door locks, because in that case, the claim had nothing at all to do with the misrepresentation. And similarly, with the subsidence cases, where the claim has got nothing at all to do with the structure of the house, you could argue that it's a very strict decision to void the policy. And the reason I'm just flagging it up here is that um, in all four of the cases that I was looking at, um, the ombudsman decision was that the complaint would not be upheld. In other words, they uh, supported the insurer in their decision. So there are several examples out there where the ombudsman, although the ombudsman has a duty to make decisions not necessarily strictly in accordance with the law, but on the basis of a fair and reasonable principle. It's just worth noting that the Ombudsman at the moment is not uh, deciding these cases in favour of the, of the policyholder. And I suppose our job as members of this profession is to decide if that is in fact fair and reasonable. I should also just mentioned in passing that, of course, these issues also relate to those of us who are involved in the life and pension side of the business. Um, you, you can easily get a situation where somebody has failed to declare a particular health condition, and then uh, maybe for, um, um, there might be a death claim, or there, there could be uh, other claims under, un, under policies where the the failure to declare a health condition has come to light, but the incident that has given rise to the claim, whether it's for disability or for uh, death, has got nothing at all to do with the non-disclosure. So it, it is an issue that, that affects us on the life and pension side as well. Um, I'd like to read a passage from an ombudsman decision. Uh, and I'll, I, it's, it's quite lengthy, but it's entirely pertinent to the subject matter of this. So uh, please bear with me as I read it, because it's quite interesting. It was, it was a, a case very similar to the door locks case that we looked at. And the Ombudsman comments, the insurer attempted not merely to repudiate the claim, but to avoid the whole policy. 
At proposal, the policyholder had confirmed that the final exit door of her home was fitted with a mortise deadlock conforming to British standard BS 3621. The loss adjuster had noted that the rear door of the policyholder's home had a deadlock which did not conform to the relevant British standard. The policyholder's explanation was that she had answered the question in the proposal form under the mistaken impression that she had the required protection. The insurer supplied documentary evidence confirming that it would not have accepted the policyholder's business if it had known the true position about the existing security locks. Strictly speaking, therefore, the insurer was entitled to avoid the policy on the grounds of misrepresentation. However, this is the Ombudsman going on to comment. However, I considered that the policyholder's insistence that she had not deliberately intended to mislead the insurer should be taken into account. The insurer was quite reasonably requiring certain security precautions uh, by the policyholder. Some insurers deal with this by imposing a warranty that such precautions will be maintained. Others do it by asking questions of the kind that had been asked in this case. Is it fair that technically different approaches to the same situation should produce radically different results? The difference in this case was that if the security precautions had been the subject of a warranty, then the fact that the break-in had occurred through a window rather than through one of the inadequately secured doors would have meant that the loss was not materially connected with the breach so that the claim could still succeed. Was it fair that the result should be different in the case before me? I did not accept that it was. I was satisfied that the policyholder had not intended deliberately to mislead the insurer. For the insurer to avoid the whole policy on the grounds that there had been an inadequately protected door, which had no bearing at all on the theft, seemed excessive. In the circumstances, I required the insurer to meet the claim. Now, if you've got a particularly long memory, you might remember the name Laurie Slade, who for some time was the Ombudsman at the Insurance Ombudsman Bureau before the formation of the Financial Ombudsman Service. And you'll be interested to know that the comments that I've just read were made by Laurie Slade 25 years ago. 25 years ago. And yet we still find ourselves discussing the same point. Um, I just and like that. that and, that, and, and that, Mike, is the point. 25 years have gone past, and even a new Insurance Act has been enacted, and we're still left with this conundrum. Is so it I think fair? The, industry has got a, the, the industry has got a job to do to at least reassess this. Roger, would you like yeah. to just uh, introduce the House on the Hill? Um, we need to go through this fairly quickly because we want to leave time for yes, questions. Yes, I'm conscious the of the time. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Well, let me first of all say that this is um, uh, a case that we've had to deal with, and regrettably, we have failed to play the insurer. Um, they're not a major insurer. Um, they are still around, but I can also say this was a disappointment of the highest magnitude. Now, this is um, the house on the hill. In fact, it was one of a, a row of terraced houses down in a valley in South Wales. And it was a row of terraced houses on the side of a hill. Um, this chap had bought insurance via a broker, but online. So he'd phoned the broker, and the broker had filled in questions that he asked um, over the phone on his platform. And the policy, when it was issued, created this statement of a property is not within 200 metres of a water court. Now, um, eventually, his home was flooded. And the policy was voided because his home actually was within 100 metres of water. 
However, the flood had originated from a blocked culvert, you know, a council-owned drain, which was parallel to the house, but up the hill. It wasn't just this one house. I think it was 28 houses in the road. They were all flooded on the same day. And this policy holder is the only one that didn't get his claim back. Um, which says something, actually, because they were all probably insured with different insurers, but nobody else took this point. Um, the loss adjuster, when he first came the day after the flood, said that uh, it would never have been possible for the river that happens to be at the bottom of the valley, a long way down, and out of sight and out of mind of the insured, and it wasn't so much a river, it was a, apparently it was a stream, you know, a large stream. Um, but he said the whole of Wales would have been flooded for the water level to get up to your house. But nevertheless, the insurer said, well, a statement of fact and a warranty is a warranty. We are entitled to take the point and we shall. Now, before they came to us, they went to um, lawyers. Um, they went to the local authority. They went to the local councillors. They went everywhere. They eventually came to us. And um, oh, sorry, they also went to the FOS. And everybody upheld the insurer, including the FOS. Now, Michael and I are very familiar with FOS decisions. And when we read this one, we thought, this can't be right. <laughs> it, just, it just doesn't make sense. Um, but that was the decision. Now, the point about it was that um, this is a real case, and we could... You could write a book about it because we spent a lot more time on this than we ought to have done, frankly, uh, because we felt that it was such a wrong decision. This has cost this family, who probably annual income 25, 30,000 a year, it's cost them over 100,000 pounds. And that's not in fees, that's just in the loss that they suffered by having the policy voided for these reasons. So they're in a pretty bad state. They owe a lot of people a lot of money. Um, and this particular insurer, um, on the second day of their um, flood, they after they sent a uh, company around to remove all the damaged goods and some of the undamaged goods, well, they lost it. It's gone. And they've argued for real over a year about whether they should pay compensation for the stuff that they took away. It is not a good advertisement for the insurance industry by a long chalk. And the issue here is that um, one of the things we said to them was, look, let's look at the history of how this uh, warranty became um, extant. And this is the history. In the broker's platform, he asked a question, or the insurer asked the question, are you near, is your property near a river, watercourse, canal, usual or, or quarry, I think, was the other one? And the answer is no. And that was true. It wasn't. But when it went through the system and came out the other side, there was a statement of fact which didn't actually reflect the question that he was asked because it had converted. And in interviewing the, uh, the insured, uh, he said, look, when I see uh, a statement of fact that says my property is not within 200 metres of a river, I believe the insurer knew what he was talking about and it wasn't within 200 metres. That's the way the insured read it. Not that he'd made a statement that was false. That he said, well, the insurer must know whether I'm within... You know, they asked me, and I said, no, I'm not near it. And they've told me, in fact, I'm not within 200 metres. So what we have here is a very good example of how the remoteness that we're getting through technology from our customers can lead to some absolutely devastating results. Because uh, when we said to the insurer, why do you not want to pay this claim? The answer was, because we don't have to. Michael. Well, Roger, I think um, it brings us back to um, whether or not there is a remedy uh, for this uh, anomaly. Uh, we've identified that uh, the Insurance Act, <coughs> uh, etc., don't uh, apply to this at all. And maybe the law commissioners missed an opportunity to iron out this uh, anomaly. Um, 
I'm reminded that uh, from time to time, the Association of British Insurers have issued statements of practice to iron out certain anomalies. And in fact, it was uh, many years ago, the ABI issued a statement of fact, way before the Insurance Act, that said that an insurer would not uh, avoid paying a claim when there's been a breach of a conditional warranty where there's no connection between that breach and the claim that occurred. So that was mm. the industry taking an initiative. Um, that then became uh, standard practice for the ombudsman to follow. And then eventually that became part of the of the law and, and, and was introduced into the uh, Insurance Act. So there is yes, a precedent here. In the for, yeah, the, the, so the, the, there is a precedent here for the industry to uh, iron out these things first and then for the legislation to follow. But also I think um, it's more important is that the most important thing here is that the industry has an opportunity to pay a claim even where the law is a bit of an ass. That is professionalism. Because why do you want to say, ah, oh, well, because you were flooded by a culvert, which we didn't ask about and would never have known about and never been concerned about, why would you not want to pay that claim? 26 out of 27 insurers said, of course we'll pay the claim. One said we don't have to. Do we need a remedy for that in law, or actually do we just need the insurance industry to do the right thing by a policyholder in those circumstances? You know, that's a separate question, well, isn't it? I think we can leave that question hanging, Roger, and we'll, uh, yes, we'll perhaps uh, we leave the yes. industry to come to some conclusion on that. Um, yes. We've had quite a few questions in. I don't know if we'll have time for all of them, but um, I'll, I'll read these through and we'll see if we can um, help you in some way. Emma says, is it correct that different terms, presumably following um, a non-disclosure, is it true that different terms does not include a different premium? Well, usually... I don't understand that. Really. No, usually... Where, 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 if an insure, if a, if a policy uh, is is potentially being voided, but it turns out that actually the insurer would not have rejected the proposal had it not been for the non-disclosure, but would have accepted it on different terms, it's quite right that uh, the insure the, the insurance company might say, well, we would have accepted this at double the premium, in which case mm -hmm. we'll pay you half the claim. I think that's the, the general yeah. rule on that. Um, yeah. Alan says, uh, during household contents renewal negotiations, it became clear that the policyholder had a collection of artworks that was specifically insured under a separate policy with a different insurer. The household insurance immediately declared the contents policy void. Is that reasonable? What about the case where the policyholder stores an expensive bike that has its own insurance? Could the main contents insurer declare the contents policy void? That's quite a long question, but fundamentally, bear in mind that if you're dealing with a consumer, the consumer is only obliged to answer the specific questions that are posed to him. So I think the answer to this would be, was there a question on the statement of fact that covered the issue? Uh, if there well, there's, another, then... there's another issue, Mike, which... If you go to the heart of the concept of insurance, if the homeowner has taken the precaution to insure the artwork separately, then he is showing good faith in the, in the application of his use of insurance. He's buying a policy. He's probably paying the right premium for that risk. Now, the house insurer, who didn't know that he had artwork in the house, may say, had I known you had artwork in the house, I wouldn't have wanted to insure your risk, because he might have considered it um, a, a, a separate risk. Yeah? Now, one of the problems, that we, we don't know any of the facts here, but let's just say that this was an, an ordinary suburban house um, where 100,000 people might happen to collect artwork of a particular value. 
the ordinary way of doing insurance nowadays is not to ask uh, many questions if you can if you can get away with not asking them if you can get somebody to buy the insurance without uh, troubling with too much information that's the way the industry is going so the, you're right that if the insurer who was ordinarily uh, just saying well this is ordinary if you like, housing stock in a suburban part of wherever in the country, and our assumptions about that property are X, Y, and Z, then in the absence of asking, by the way, do you have in your house, for example, valuable works of art or exotic animals, for example? You know, I happen to know somebody who's kept a panda in his garage. Not, not a friend of mine I used to have, but I know where it is. <laughs> I knew where it was. And people that kept reptiles and all kinds of things. Now, those things, if you can understand an insurer saying, well, I think that was material information. You can understand it. But if you want to find out these extraordinary things about the people we insure, then there's no better way of doing it than asking questions. And you focus the policy hold or proposer's mind to the things you want to know as a prudent underwriter. So coming back to the question, um, whether it's right or not depends on the facts. And I'm not going to give an opinion because you can look at it both ways. You can't actually have quick answers to things where, where we're looking at an industry which is leaving open for actually after the event underwriting, so many questions that, that lead the insurer to say, well, if I'd known that, I wouldn't have, I'd have changed my mind. That's what we're dealing with. That's the issue. What we need to do is, I shouldn't say we need to do, what the industry should do is ask such questions that focus the policyholder's mind to the things the underwriter wants to know. And frankly, in my view, if they don't, do that reasonably, then they can't really have um, a complaint on. Thank you, Roger. Uh, Matthew asks uh, a question on a different subject. This is to do with um, failure to declare uh, previous insolvencies. Matthew says, no, yes. "Have you ever mystery shopped? Have you ever mystery shopped an insurer to test the issue on, say, a 1989 winding up?" Have you ever um, done that, 89 winding up, but I. But I have I have mystery shopped, and I'm I, I think we did about thirty eight different uh, quotes, and we got about thirty eight different answers, but none of them went anywhere close to um, identifying the issue, nowhere close to it. So this is really the point. I mean, if you're looking at something of nineteen eighty nine, what relevance is it to somebody? underwriting today what do you really want to know and let me let me say this we we see quite a lot of these cases and we're reasonably successful in dealing with them but the fundamental issue is that why does an underwriter want to ask questions about the previous financial history of the policyholder largely to ascertain whether there's fraud or dishonesty it's a moral hazard question that's what it's all about and if there wasn't any moral hazard, then why would you say you wouldn't have underwritten the risk? If you take certain areas of uh, the economy, um, many areas of the economy, actually, it is very, very rare for most people in business not to have failed sometime in getting to where they're being successful. And, you know, coming back to um, the, the economy we have at the moment, where people in um, care homes, hospitality, all kinds of businesses that um, actually are running on, an, on a thin margin most of the time just to keep going. Some of those people will fail. Are we saying that the insurance industry is actually saying if ever you fail, if ever you've made a mistake, you're uninsurable? That can't be right. So I wait, think wait, that what we're looking America, at... Would it, Roger? Is, so it, wouldn't, no. it wouldn't happen in America. It's almost a badge of honour. Anyway, mo it's moving on, <laughs> your friend of mine, Philip, says, is it time that insurers went back to asking, asking specific questions, re-material facts, such as when we used to complete declarations on proposal forms, then a proposer would know what was needed to be known by insurers? Because 
it, to, to some extent, we've got this already with consumer, but not, not with commercial. Do, do you have a view on that, Roger? Well, I do, because I think the point is, I come back to the fundamental question. If, the, if, if you like, the law requires you to tell um, the insurer, prudent insurer, all material, everything is material in circumstances that might affect his judgment, surely the first thing you've got to know is what might affect his judgment. And no policyholder, no proposer will know that. So the only way you can attention, you can focus the proposer's mind is to ask him questions which are going to focus his mind. And in the absence of doing that, you can't expect him to know what to say. So I think Philip is absolutely right. Um, I do think that questions are terribly important. And, you know, ironically, one of the things uh, we've got now, which we didn't have in, you know, in our youth, like, when we were doing this kind of work, we didn't have technology which was capable of capturing information. Nowadays, if you ask these relevant questions, you can also capture the information that they tell you, which would be hugely powerful and hugely valuable. But actually, ironically, we've gone the other way. And we've said, well, let's see how few questions we can ask. If I may remind you of a um, a case we had to deal with with the number of bedrooms. Remember a five-bedroom or seven-bedroom? This was a case uh, where a fire occurred in a house that had a loft conversion. And in the loft, there was uh, a dividing wall, and somebody left a bed up there. Now, it was being used as a loft, but the loss adjuster afterwards said, ah, oh, this was there's, a, there's an open loft here, and it's got an old bed in the loft, so it must be two more bedrooms. So the insurer avoided the policy. And they did that because it was rated on the number of bedrooms. They didn't ask very much else about the house. They just said, how many bedrooms have you got? And the truthful answer was five. So I think we're getting to a state where I don't think there's going to be a credible answer for the industry um, in these matters of um, risk assessment um, and, and avoidance, unless it can be demonstrated the insurer took reasonable steps to focus the mind of the proposer on the things that the insurer reasonably wanted to know. That's my take. Yeah, and I think the other thing to say is that uh, sometimes an insurer would prefer to rely on the proposer's requirement to make a fair presentation and, and, and leave it entirely with the proposer because as soon as the insurer mm -hmm. asks yeah. specific questions then they can get into a situation whereby the way that they framed those questions, they, it might turn out that they've actually waived their right to, to certain other information related to that question. But that's that's that another is, discussion for another day. Um, that is another discussion. That's a webinar in itself. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, a question from Stephen, which I'll take. It says, under SIDRA, is, it not the insur is not the insurer required to ask clear and unambiguous questions? If the insurer wants to define its acceptance risk parameters at the outset of the policy, then it has to ask about keys as part of the application. Having it as a contract condition does not do that. Hence, I think that would be unfair. Um, I think basically, Stephen, yes, you're right. Uh, 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 under a consumer contract uh, and under SIDRA, the insurer must ask unambig unambiguous questions. And in fact, in the examples that we were looking at, the insurer did ask, or it was a statement on a statement of, of fact, where the the proposer stated that they did have a certain quality of locks, and it turned out that they didn't, and 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 that's where the unfairness comes in, where the insurer chooses to void. Uh, moving on, uh, Matthew says, "Is insurance really a profession?" My view is it it is not. Roger. Sorry, I didn't hear that. There's just a break in the communication. Say yeah. it again, would you? Matthew says, is insurance really a profession? My view is that it is not. Oh, my word, Matthew. I think you could do um, a webinar on that as well, couldn't you, Roger? I think you could do a webinar. Look, let's put it like this. I can tell you that I have worked since 1978 largely with professions all of them, law, architecture, surveying, accountancy, medical, and lots more. I mean, I've done it all. 
and I really do understand what professions are about. First thing that a profession has that we don't is a practice certificate, and they can have it removed. You can, you can lose your practicing certificate. We don't have that. The second thing that professionals all have is they have to be qualified by examination. We don't. In our industry, people have said time after time, and I've been discussing this with people since about the 1980s, oh, but we are very professional. What they mean is that they do a very good job for their client. And that's perfectly fair to say that. I would love to think that insurance because I would say, and I do know what other professions are because I, you know, I was a specialist in professional indemnity and banks and all that kind of stuff. I really do understand it. I would say that what you have to know as an insurance practitioner, whether you're an insurer, um, an agent, or a broker, is complex. It's very complex. It combines law. It combines tax, accounting, insurance in itself. But all of these things are mashed together into a contract, which ironically is probably the only expensive contract that people buy, for which they don't get legal advice before they pay for it. So actually, we've got every reason on the planet to be professional and to want to be professional. But the outside world, including the law, looks at our industry as an industry because we don't need a professional qualification and because we don't have a practice that we can lose if we are um, mostly negligent or dishonest. And that actually, I think, is the nub of it. The CII are doing yeah. a brilliant job to create professionalism. But we And sorry, there's one last thing, which was the commission thing. Professionals don't get paid on commission. And what we say as an industry is we couldn't persuade our clients to pay us for our advice. And if you can't persuade people to pay you for your advice, you have to ask what is the value of that advice. And that is a whole different argument. Roger, if I just add a PS to what you said, uh... <clears throat> I, I applaud the CII's uh, endeavours to encourage as many members as possible to take their exams, but yeah. there is that problem that our profession is in danger of being de-skilled because a lot of the difficult decisions these days are simply passed on to lawyers. But don't comment on that because I know you would have oh, a lot to say. <laughs> and, 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 and <laughs> we, 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 we've only got two minutes. So just one final question, and, and apologies yeah. to those that we haven't been able to address, but we're going to capture these questions and find a way to send out some responses. But Daniel says, is there any difference in a policy term, if a to if, sorry, is there any difference if a policy term incorporates the word condition in place of warranty? And before you comment on that, Roger, I would say that there used to be a huge difference between the two, but the Insurance Act has tempered the severity of warranties considerably. But it, 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 is there still a difference between a condition and a warranty, Roger? Well, I was discussing this very thing with counsel last week, and he says yes. Ah. But I'm not allowed to uh, tell you why. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, it's a big issue. Well, I mean, it's, it, is, it is an issue. It's a, it's a term that needs actually some massaging as to what it, what it is intended, because it, does, it can have different meanings, yes. Right here. Well, um, we're going to have to start winding this up. And um, I just want to say that I hope this hasn't been too rushed for you. We've actually covered quite a lot. We've highlighted what we think is something of an anomaly. We're not here to tell the industry what to do. We're here to spark off some intelligent debate on the issue. And um, you will be interested to know, I hope, that we, we are publishing a, an article in association with the Chartered Insurance Institute on this subject, which follows very much the, uh, the uh, content of this webinar. So look out for that. And then before long, we'll be looking at a very similar issue uh, where uh, policies uh, can be voided because of the failure to declare past claims and one or two other issues. So that's something else to 
to look forward to. But for now, from Roger and for me, it's uh, cheerio. Goodbye.